You know, say what you want about Dodge build quality, but the engineers were nice enough to give you these self-tappers. And now they knew that they shouldn't use stainless. They knew that they should use something that would corrode so that when you smack your head on them, it's just letting you know that, hey, you almost hit your head on the, on the trans tunnel, dummy. But we gave you this nice little reminder to keep you from hitting that. And uh, it injects the, the tetanus straight into your brains. So that way it really sticks in your mind that, hey, don't smack your head on the trans tunnel. The day has finally come to install my 47RH. I'm doing a hard line replacement with braided stainless. And I want to make sure that I remember the flow of where the ATF is traveling. So it's out of the transmission to the cooler on the side of the block, out of that cooler, around. And then uh, so it returns from the air to fluid back to the transmission. And I'll show you that under the truck real quick too. So here we're coming out and across to here. And then it's the upper line here, which goes to the rear port comes back out of the heat exchanger back across this way all the way over here and then it's the outboard hard line here which travels forward and then you can see it there where it comes this way across the side of the radiator and it's the upper line that we're following to the driver's side of the cooler and then the passenger side of the cooler comes out right here goes down the side of the radiator and then becomes the inboard line along the block and then we trace the inboard line from the fluid to air heat exchanger all the way aft to where it dumps back into the transmission so that's the fluid flow that I need to remember for when I replace all of that. I drove the truck over here with no rear drive shaft. It was getting shortened. I ended up cutting it one and one eighth of an inch because that's the difference that I measured between the first gen adapter plate and the 1994 second gen adapter plate. I also got new U-joints and a new center bearing for it as well. And you'll see that later. I'm going to start by pulling the uh, T-case skid plate out of the way. Got this flange disconnected just by uh, locking up the hubs. Front drive shafts out of the way. Now I'm going to disconnect the transfer case shift linkage. Next, the four-wheel drive indicator needs to come off. Now I can get to work on this flange. While that flange drains, I'm just going to start disconnecting stuff. Starting with the uh, temp probe here. I'm actually going to be putting one in the pan, so I don't use this for anything anyway. And there's the pigtail that controls overdrive. Got that part of the loom tucked out of the way now. Next I'm going to pull the linkage, get the uh, TV cable out of the way. Next, I'm going to get this linkage bar out of the way. I need to remove this bolt where the bracket is supported up here. And then I need to remove these two bolts. All right, I got my TV cable and my linkage and whatnot finagled kind of out of the way. I just flange back here on the transfer case is about done leaking. So I'm going to see if I can finesse that out of there now. Seeing how much ATF can fit inside this pocket is telling me that there was no real reason for me to calculate how much extra ATF I was going to need for this swap. I mean, the dipstick sits at the same height in the pan no matter what, so it's probably best to just go off of that. Now I'm set up to make a nice big mess and pull the pan off to get all the ATF out. While that's starting to drain, I'm going to pull off the flex plate access cover and then probably start taking those bolts out. And in order to do that, I need to pull this plug on the passenger side of the adapter plate. 
and then install my barring tool. All right, I got the pan emptied. It actually looks pretty good in here. And now I'm gonna put it back up, just have it out of my way. So the exhaust is being annoying and it doesn't wanna separate. So that's fine. And I just uh, ratchet strapped it out of the way instead. All right, so now I can turn my barring tool counterclockwise, which will bring the engine clockwise and get my flex plate to torque converter bolts where I can access them. All right, got all six of those bolts out. And now I'm just verifying that there's nothing holding the converter to the flex plate. All right, next I'm gonna spread out some more cardboard and drip pans, and I'm gonna take all these hard lines off of here. If your lines are pretty seized up like mine, you may not actually have to cut them. You might be able to use vice grips on the case fitting and then a crow's foot on the line fitting. Next I'm going to go ahead and pull out the fill tube which is attached to the bell housing by that bolt. Alright, all the lines and crap are out of the way. Making a nice big mess. Now I'm going to get the transmission supported so that I can unbolt the cross member and the bell housing bolts. So I was hoping that this was a PDD trans and uh, it turns out that it is. Should be able to sell this and recoup a uh, decent portion of the cost of the swap. The barring tool is going back in. Now I can hold the flex plate still as I remove all the bolts. I need to take the two wires off of the starter on the opposite side there and then remove all the bolts and pull this entire piece off so that I can get at the rear main housing. And another important thing to know about is there's these little bolts that support the bracket which supports the cooler and that bolts to this adapter plate so those need to come off and they're easy to forget about. Alright, greasy old adapter plate and starter are out of the way. Alright, now it's time to do the rear main. So I'm going to pull the housing off Hopefully not mess up the pan gasket too bad. I definitely messed up the pan gasket, so I'm just gonna put some uh, Yama Bond in the uh, the joints there, and hopefully that'll prevent any leaks, but I don't know. I'm not hopeful, it's a Cummins. All right, now I'm gonna bust into my rear main seal kit here. Let's see what we got going on. All right, I'm gonna put this piece on first and then pound everything in after the sleeve and the uh, rear main. I had to trim this gasket a little bit and as far as I can tell, it looks like the fat side goes to the right. So I'm gonna get all this installed with some nice big globs of RTV in the corners and then RTV on the bottom to replace where the oil pan gasket was. And then torque specs for the small bolts up here, seven foot pounds. 18 foot pounds for the pan. Now I'm gonna pound the new rear main complete with the crank repair sleeve into place. And it doesn't really need it, like the crank isn't that bad, but I like these and I really do not feel like taking this apart again if it leaks. So this is kind of a sure bet. And there's a chamfered side to make it easier to start. that's all good now I'm gonna put this stuff on pause back here and address the coolers what I'm gonna go ahead and do is remove these supply and return lines to the cooler and then blast it out with compressed air at a pretty low pressure but just to try and clean it out maybe a little bit I don't know all right I got it all cleaned out and I flushed it and then I got the old lines out of the way and made sure that the new 90 degree fittings were going to fit behind the grill and that all looks kosher so now I'm going to do the heat exchanger on the side of the block and I'm just going to blast it out with the air chuck. Now I'm going to install my new starter 
on my second gen adapter plate and torque the bolts to 32 foot pounds. Now I'm just getting my cross member cleaned up. I'm gonna replace the bushings. They're actually in pretty terrible condition and they're really gummy. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and elongate these slots the same amount that I cut my drive shaft. So just a little bit, right around an inch, maybe a little more. All right, so my adapter plate's ready to go. And I'm gonna install it with just a little bit of Loctite and the big bolts get torqued to 44 foot pounds and there's no way I can get my torque wrench on the smaller bolts. So those three are gonna be guten tight. I've heard that the second gen starter will chafe on the frame somewhere, but I don't know. I'm gonna to have to take a look and see whether I'm gonna to have to do some, uh, some clearancing or not. The three up here are an absolute nightmare, by the way. The best way that I found to get them aligned is to jam a flathead against the bracket on this side to pry. And then on this side, stick a screwdriver to align it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and reconnect the starter. I ended up putting just a little bit of uh, anti-chafing tape here. And now it's time for the flex plate to go on. I kind of transferred the mark on the old flex plate to the new one so that the relationship was pretty much the same. I don't know if it'll make one bit of difference, but... And I'm gonna torque all of these to 100 foot-pounds with blue Loctite. All right, now I'm gonna get a couple quarts in my uh, triple disc converter here and then install it in place. And I made this little bracket that should help retain it as I lift the transmission. Another thing I forgot to mention is the, uh, the second gen throttle valve lever is not going to work, so I'm going to install the uh, first gen component. Alright, now I'm going to get this whole assembly lifted into place and mounted. The uh, bell housing bolts are 50 foot pounds from what I've been reading, and then the uh, converter bolts are 35 foot pounds and I'm going to use blue Loctite on mine. Alright, now that that's set into place, I'm going to go ahead and lift my cross member up and get the million bolts put back together. And these are the torque specs. Alright, now I'm just going to throw some paint marks on all of the torque converter to flex plate bolts just so that I can inspect them from time to time and make sure they're not loosening up because that would be a really bad day. Next it's time for the transfer case to go back in. I got my nice new gasket cut here. I got a little bit of sealant which is going to go right here and I'm going to torque the studs to 35 foot-pounds. Getting closer, it's time to throw the drive shaft in. And the drive shaft did not get cut properly, so I don't know if there was just a miscommunication with whoever ended up cutting this for me, but um, they got it pretty far off. So I gotta bring this back to the shop and get it cut and balanced again. So I didn't notice this before, because the engine was kind of leaned backwards because there wasn't the transmission in place. But with everything bolted together, the starter actually sandwiches the brake line between the frame. So that's no good. So I need to actually pull this thing off and do some rearranging, I think. All right, I'm a little more happy with that. Now it's running down the top of the frame rail and not getting sandwiched. Next, I'm going to attack this linkage here, and the, uh, the second gen piece here needs to come off. And then the piece that I have attached to the TV cable here is going to take its place. And I don't know how much of an angle that's going to put in the linkage, but uh, we'll see what happens. Honestly, I'd rather have it be a little bit cockeyed than drill more holes in my frames. It does look a little jank, but... We'll see. All right, now it's time to put the dipstick in. I'm gonna be using the first gen one because I think it's uh, gonna fit a little easier. 
and it appears that the uh, dipstick protrudes about the same amount as the second gen one so it should be fine and then I put two o-rings on there and I'm gonna put just a little bit of sealant on it and then stuff it in there and bolt it to the bell housing all right next I'm gonna take a bunch of uh, magical braided stainless and some fancy fittings and make some new transmission fluid lines. I left a little extra slack on this end just so that if I decide to someday I can add uh, a larger transmission cooler, these will be able to reach. Alright, now it's time to get some of this wire loom stuff back where it belongs. This is going back on top of the transfer case here. This one here is going to go to the 3 pin. So there's actually two overdrive control plugs. One is still connected to the stock computer, and then the other is just to a lockup switch that's mounted on the console. So both of those are going to be getting taken out just to clean up this wiring a bit. But All right, now it's time to get this bad boy serviced. You can use a lot of different things, but uh, this is what was recommended to me, and it's uh, reasonably priced. All right, it's time for round two on the drive shaft. The shop that I had shorten it the first time fixed it free of charge supposedly. Hopefully it fits. <sighs> Alright, it fits this time. And uh, once again, 14 foot pounds, 50 foot pounds on the center bearing, and 22 foot pounds on this rear U joint. But once again, this is an AAM 1050, not a Dana 70, so it's going to be uh, different if you still have the stock rear axle. Now it's time to see if this thing feels like it's going to move or not. Well, it, it seems to be working. Uh, the only issue is my little indicator there I think is a little bit thrown off just because the, uh, the linkage is at a bit of an angle now, so I'll probably end up playing around with that to get it straightened out, but I mean, so far, so good. I think it's time for a test drive now. So it's been about a week since I completed the swap, and everything's been going pretty well, except I had a pretty decent leak coming from these two fittings. I was driving down the highway, on my way to go pick up a free motorcycle when I noticed uh, streaks of some type of fluid running down the hood towards the windshield and uh, that's when I realized that these were probably leaking and I came up with a solution for it as I just picked out an o-ring from my generic kit here that uh, was just the right size to sandwich between the female flare and the male flare this is a uh, number 112 in the kit here and that's the size of it and I put just a little bit of this stuff on the threads just for good measure I know it's not the right thing to do but it's working well so far another little change that I made is I moved the linkage around just a little bit so that it's more square with the transmission it's still not perfect and I don't know I'll probably end up playing around with it a bit more but as you can see there's less of a drastic angle going on all right, now it's time to wire in the control for this thing. Now there's a few different ways you can do this. You can use like a CompuShift computer that, uh, that does all this for you, but I kind of like manual control over stuff. So I'm just gonna have two switches, one switch to lock the converter and one switch to shift into overdrive. And uh, I found this connector. This is what the, uh, the keyed end of it looks like. You can buy a connector on PATC that looks like it'll work but I tried that one and it doesn't work and I think it was like $24 which is a ripoff so I got this one from the junkyard for like a dollar basically I just took a whole fistful of 
three pin Dodge connectors and this was the correct one. I wish I remember exactly which vehicle I pulled it off of but I don't but yeah, I'm 90% sure that it was on the uh, AC compressor. So anyways, uh, since I found the connector, this is how it's situated in the transmission. Bell housing ends over here. Uh, now the clip side of it is broken off, but it faces out obviously. And then from there, the middle pin is going to be 12 volts. The rear wire is going to run to a toggle switch which controls the converter. And then the front wire is going to run to a switch which controls the overdrive. And, and these are the, uh, the switches that I decided to use. They're a uh, military surplus component used in some type of aircraft. That's the part number for them. And I'm just going to use two of these. I really like the feel of them. They got a nice, nice click. And they're made in America, which is a nice little bonus. And then I built this little pod for them. And this is going to mount underneath the steering column. And this will be how I control the transmission. So Alright, so I made a little pigtail there. You can see it wrapped in the, uh, in the red. And then that goes over to a weather pack connector. And then it runs up to my steering column. And I'll show you that. So here's how it looks from the driver's seat. As you can see, I got my little pod all set up down here. It actually turned out pretty clean. I got it wired in real nicely so there's nothing dangling, looking ugly. And the one on the right controls overdrive, so that shifts into fourth gear there. And then this one here controls the converter lock. I really hope that I don't regret going the built automatic route. I don't know. Time, time will tell whether this is, you know, going to be durable and long-lasting as an option. I hope that it will be. I don't know. At the same time, I kind of wonder whether I should have put, like, an Eaton Fuller in this thing. I'm really happy with it for now. I still have a few things left to do, like figure out the transfer case linkage and get the, uh, the front drive shaft spacing figured out. But I will save that for a later video. Thanks for watching.